All of us at the Dub Network would like to thank the crew at Herman Marshall Whiskey for sponsoring another episode of Harps Court. Herman Marshall Small Batch Whiskey is handcrafted and award-winning, and whether it be their Texas bourbon, Texas rye, Texas single malt, or their blended bourbon whiskey, all are built from the grain up, just like good whiskey should be. And make sure you check out their amazing tasting room in Wiley, Texas, if you get a chance. I promise you, you won't be disappointed. It's a great place to pop on in, enjoy one of their specialty drinks or two, or for hosting special occasions like birthday parties, mixers, weddings, or receptions. Thank you so much, Herman Marshall. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Harp's Court. I'm your host, Derek Harper. I am honored to have one of my favorite guys and Howard Beck. Howard is one of the top journalists in, in, in sports that there is. And welcome to the show, Howard. How are you, man? Harp, I'm doing great, man. Appreciate you. Thank you for the uh, very kind introduction. Uh, great to see you. And as we were just discussing offline, it's uh, phenomenal that we get to reverse roles here after all these years <laughs> because I did cover I, you for a brief time. Hey, let me tell you, I would, I, I, I would I have asked never thought. Now it's your turn. I appreciate that. I would have never thought that this would come to fruition. But the fact that it has, and by the way, Howard has uh, Howard Beck has worked as a, 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 a NBA writer both in New York and in Los Angeles. And I played in New York and Los Angeles, so we have that in common. What I want while we're on that, what 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 do you think the difference is as a writer, from a writer's perspective, in writing for the NBA in New York opposed to Los Angeles? You know, it's funny, Harp. Like the the job is the job wherever we are, right? But I'd yes. be lying if I said it doesn't have a different vibe or a different feeling in different markets, right? So I had seven years covering the Lakers in LA, including the lockout year when you were uh, with the Lakers. Yes. Um, I've been in New York for 19 years, nine of which I was covering the Knicks on a regular basis for the New York Times. And they're both competitive markets. In both places, you have a ton of media, a ton yep. of interest, but it is more laid back in LA, both among the fans and the media. It is more intense and sometimes uh, edgy, I guess, among both fans and media in New York. And it is it was definitely an adjustment when I got here in 2004, uh, after seven years of covering the Lakers in LA, to, to kind of try to just adapt to figure out the New York vibe. Uh, yeah. It, it, it's different. The vibe at games is different. <laughs> the vibe in the press room is, is different. Uh, it is just more intense. The traffic is different. A little bit louder. <laughs> The tra you know what, though? I'll say this. like People <laughs> will, will say, like whether well, you're in New York, L.A., Boston, all these places with traffic. I, all I know is this. When I lived in L.A., I, if I went to – if I left – I lived in Hermosa Beach, south of LAX. It might take me 45, 50 minutes to get to Staples Center downtown. Yeah. It might take two hours. The right. one thing I love about New York – I love many things about New York, but I'll tell you this. Most days, I hop on that subway, it's 35 minutes to the Garden, or it's 15 minutes to Barclays Center where the Nets play. And it's the same every single time. So I'll take having mass transit over the L.A. highways any day. And I say that as a California native who grew up, you know, and, and learned to drive on all those highways, right? Like, I'll, I'll, I'll take the subway every day. I, I, I hear you on that. And I, I, can, I can relate, actually, to what you're talking about. Unless you've been on a rock, man, everybody knows that the, the NBA playoffs are going going on right now. And I felt, I don't know how you feel about this, Howard, but I felt like all year that there's been so much, there's so much parity in the NBA until it was very difficult to really pinpoint who was the best team in the East, who was the best team in the West. Has anything about the playoffs, and I'm sure it has, surprised you thus far moving towards the second round of the playoffs? Yeah, I mean, look, you're right. This is a season like no other that I can remember in my 26 years of covering it, and I'm sure that you've, you know, the same observation for you as a former yeah. player and broadcaster who has been following this, following this and been in it even longer than I have. There's never been a season like this during my time. Right. Um, so almost nothing would surprise me except 
Except we're talking on Thursday afternoon, the day after the Miami Heat. The Heat, who were a uh, a play-in team, a play-in team that became the eighth seed and knocked out the top seed of Milwaukee Bucks. Like so, yeah. Even in a year of parody, that one was a shocker to me, Harp. I am Same. still in shock a little yes. bit. I'm sure the Bucks are in shock. <laughs> we don't get eight-one upsets very often in this league, and it, it, it's of all the teams, of all the number ones that could have gone down in the last 10, 20 years. This isn't what I would have ex- expected. Um, yeah, yeah. The Bucks, obviously, a championship team just two years ago. Right. Giannis, a two-time MVP, who's a finalist for MVP again this year. Well, he'll he'll probably finish third. Yeah. Um, this is a stunner, and and I I just cannot even imagine what the Bucks organization is thinking today as they right. are trying to sift through the wreckage and figure out how to get this thing back on track. You know, which brings me to this, Art, after the game, and that's the worst time, I think, as a reporter, to ask a player tough questions, right? And I saw where you retweeted the uh, the situation with Giannis, and I forget who it was that asked him the question as to whether or not it was a disappointment yeah. of a season. What's your take on it? Do you feel – I feel like it is a disappointment. Yeah. I, if you're expected to come out of the East and you don't make you fall short of that, that's a disappointment. I don't care how you how you look at it. Yeah, I think what got people so the question was uh, by from Eric Name, really great reporter for the Athletic, based in Milwaukee. Yeah, and if anybody knows anything about Eric Name, and I, I want to mention this because obviously he's 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 taken a few hits today. Of um, course. He, the way he asked the question was about was not about um, disappointment, but failure. He said, "Giannis, do you consider the season a failure?" And he asked the same quote, the uh, same um, question of Coach Mike Budenholzer. To me, it's a it's the fair and right question because yes, they're the number one seed. They were the favorites to win the championship. They uh-huh. didn't just lose early. They lost as early as can be. They lost in the first round to an eighth seed, and in five games, they couldn't even stretch this thing to six or seven games. Um, and it's fair when you know that the next day is going to be all the fans and media are going to be saying yes. and, and other players are going to be saying it's a failure. It's yes. fair to then ask Giannis, listen, is it a failure to you? What I loved about Giannis's response was that he said, uh, no, I don't accept that. This is all just these are all just steps. This is just the journey. Basically. Yes. I'm yes. Paraphrasing. I thought he handled it well. But, and I it, it was a really thoughtful and constructive response to a difficult question, but it's also the right question. And I, and I want to hear that response because what Giannis is telling us is you may all look at this as a failure. And look, I'm going to say this again, as I've said uh, f- f- multiple times today, objectively speaking, it's a failure. If you're the number one seed and you're a favorite to win the championship yes. and you lose in the first round to an eighth seed in five games, it's a yes. failure. Of course it is. It's also fa- fine and fair for you as the player to tell me, listen, it's not a failure in my mind because I view things in a in a broader, more long uh, range manner, and this is another step on our journey. And maybe this is what we need to do to, or to, to to reckon with in order for us to build up better again. Like that's fine. I'm fine yeah. with Yana saying that. But the question itself was absolutely fair. It's not a gotcha question, and it's a chance to or to, you're extending an opportunity. To, to the people that you're covering to put it in perspective. Just because we as the media and fans might consider it a failure doesn't mean the Bucks necessarily will. Now that said, right. Giannis says no, not a failure. Fine. I totally respect that and I loved his response. Right. Um, I guarantee you the GM is going to consider it a failure. Absolutely. And the owners who employ the GM and the coach and all those players are going to consider it a failure. I guarantee Absolutely. you that 99.9999% of Bucks fans are considering it a failure. Yeah, so because because of, course, because of the expectation. Perfectly fair that, and appropriate question to yeah. me. Yeah. So you 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 said putting things in perspective. Could you can you Howard put in perspective what Jimmy Butler did for the Miami Heat? I, I don't think you know you you can go back and 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 look at some of the all time great performances. I was a huge fan back then. I was in the league. Michael Jordan against Boston. I mean, there's just been so many great heroics. Uh, in the playoffs, have you seen a better performance for two or three games than what we saw Jimmy Butler put on against the Milwaukee Bucks? 
Well, I mean, listen, um, I covered Shaq and Kobe for those seven years. You mm -hmm. got to, to play alongside those guys. So we've seen the, you know, Shaq and Kobe have some incredible performances. I've covered, you know, the Warriors um, in their finals runs. I've covered LeBron James in a bunch of his finals, most of his finals. So, yeah, I mean, you and I have both witnessed some incredible postseason performances, and I would say that Jimmy Butler's might be right up there. But what strikes me about it, and I'm going to turn this back to, to you, Harp. Yeah. Jimmy does not, in the regular season and for the entirety of his career, he does not profile as, as this guy. I'm not saying that – I'm not diminishing at any, him by any stretch. In fact, yeah. this is, this is a, a compliment. When we talk about great postseason performances, and you and I could list off Michael, LeBron, Kobe, Shaq, yeah. Tim Duncan – any yes. number of players, Kevin Durant, Kawhi Leonard, Steph Curry. I mean, the list, the list goes on and on. Perennial MVPs? Yeah, but these are all perennial MVP candidates, perennial All-NBA guys, guys who chart out as future Hall of Famers. Jimmy Butler does not have the profile of any of them. So the question I have for you is, because your memory may be better than mine on this and goes back a little further, Yeah, is there anybody that you can recall who could turn it up this many levels in the postseason, who is not a superstar in the in the regular season is just a really great player, but in the yeah. postseason becomes this MVP. Like who who else yeah. has done this? How here's what I'd say to that question is that it, it, it's one thing to pop up and and have heroics that 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 helps your team to 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 prevail and to get where they want to go, right? But it's another thing to have to do it. If he doesn't do what he does, for crying out loud, Howard, they were without some key components to their team. There's no hero right now. Kyle Lowry been in and out of the lineup all year long. They've had a lot of issues. This team had scoring issues all year long, okay? So Jimmy Buck, Jimmy Butler recognizes what's going on, recognizing the moment and I'm going to be honest with you, there's no way I thought he was going to go to Milwaukee and match what he did in Miami the game before. I didn't think that was possible. And I think it goes to what Spo said about Jimmy. Jimmy has a, 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 a unique mindset when it comes to trying to win basketball games. You know, they call him playoff Jimmy. So – he has a switch. I don't believe in those switches. I think you have to stay even keel and be be ready to do what you have to do at all times. He seizes the moment to me better than any player that I've ever seen. I know Michael Jordan, you named all the guys. I don't have to go down that list again, but I think to get a nickname like Playoff Jimmy Butler shows you how 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 durable and, and, and how, how, how tough-minded Jimmy Butler is. And I don't know if you know his background, but he was given away uh, as a child by his parents, right? And I think that has a lot to do with it, if you would. You, know, you think about a guy that's, that, that was raised by a totally different family than, than his parents and his other siblings or what have you. That, that put, that's a crazy mindset. Anyway, to be able to do that. So I echo your sentiments, man. I, I just don't think that there's anybody. Everybody does it their way. You know, Frank Sinatra, you know, I did it my way. But he does it his way. And you know Pat Riley just as well as I do, right? He's a Pat Riley type guy. Me against the world. Coach, if I've heard Coach Riley say that one time, I've heard him say it a million times. And that's the mentality to me that Jimmy Butler has. And um, I, I just thought, I thought it was tremendous. I couldn't sleep after the game because of my adrenaline and how exciting it was to watch the performance. And I, I think he said something to uh, Drew Holiday last night that I own you or something like that. And you're talking about owning one of the top defenders in the NBA. <laughs> Drew Holiday is pretty solid. But I, I, I was blown away. What else has su surprised you, Howard, if you would, about the, uh, the early start to the playoffs? Of course, the Knicks advancing to the second round has to be one. Yeah, I mean, look, you know, I always say like a five upsetting a four isn't really much of an upset. You're literally next to each other in the standing. So there's not a lot separating the Cavs and the Knicks, but it is an upset of sorts. I mean, certainly like the Cavs were a 50 win team. They, by most measures, had the better top end talent. Um, but I think the Knicks had the overall better depth, clearly. And besides that, you know, the Knicks, like it's funny to, you know, 
because there's different level of stars in this league, right? So the Cavs have the established stars, right? Jared Allen has been an all-star. Evan yes. Mobley is a rising star um, who's still got a lot of growth to do, clearly. Darius Garland made the all-star team a year ago for the first time. Donovan Mitchell, multi multi-time all-star. Jalen Brunson owned this series. Jalen yes. Brunson outplayed Donovan Mitchell and Darius Garland. Jalen Brunson has never been an all-star. He's never been all-NBA. Right. He's, he's not going to be all NBA when those teams are announced in the next week or so. Um, and their best. Hold on a second, Howard. Give resume. me Howard. Howard, hold yeah. on one second. You say he is not. You don't think he has a chance? Make to make all NBA? Yes, one of those teams. No, Jalen Br Jalen Brunson's. So you know, I'm I'm one of the voters. This was a really tough exercise. It is every year, but like the number of guards, there were like at least twelve guards in consideration for six spots. Yeah. Um, and even then, like I moved I moved Jalen Brown to forward to get him on my all NBA so that I could free up another guard spot. The forward oh, wow. wasn't quite as deep. Um, but no, I don't think Jalen Brunson's gonna Jalen Brunson will get all the NBA votes, but I don't think he's gonna actually make it. I could be wrong. I could actually absolutely be wrong. And you know, look, if we were including the first round <laughs> in our consideration, the ballot yeah. so people know you the ballots are due the day after the regular season ends. It's a regular season award. So what has happened in the last week or so of, of them smoking the Cavs in five games yeah. doesn't count. Um, but, uh, but so their best player by resume is Julius uh, is is, uh, is is Julius Randle, and like he had a terrible series and got hurt again. Yeah, um, he might make All NBA again. But the fact that the Knicks um, built of you know, some young guys, some vets, some guys who are just, you know, scrappers, whatever. They they strike me as being very much like a 90s type of Knicks team, yeah. right? Like, you guys, yeah. like, you had Patrick Ewing in the 90s, but everybody after Ewing, like, there, there was no, there was no, you know, like, the, the Bulls had Scotty and Michael. The Knicks had Patrick Ewing and John Stark. I would say John Stark. And, yeah, but... Nobody at the level of a Scottie Pippen, right? Right, Nobody right. At the Absolutely level of right. Shaq had Kobe. LeBron and Dwayne Wade had each other. LeBron has Anthony Davis now, whatever. Kevin Durant had Westbrook. Kevin Durant had Steph. Like the Knicks of the 90s were Patrick Ewing and a, just a, a bunch of really tough minded, hard working, hard playing yes. dudes. And that's what this Knicks team is to me, minus Patrick Ewing. It's like there is no one guy who you say, there's your future Hall of Famer. All of them right. are built the way that the 90s Knicks were. And so that's, I think, what's what's so easy, what's so endearing about this team, what's so easy to like about them. Um, and I also will say this as we go into, you know, a, a renewal of the Knicks heat rivalry with in the second round. Yeah. Jalen Brunson and Jimmy Butler have a lot in common, right? Jalen Brunson was a second rounder. Jimmy Butler was the 30th overall pick in his draft. I remember. Neither of them had any expectations when they came in. And Jimmy Butler's now been a multiple-time All-Star and All-NBA. Jalen Brunson's not there yet technically, but he's like clearly, by the way he played this season, he's going to start getting those accolades too. But both of these guys, they're not, they don't leap out of the gym. They're not, right. not the fastest, the quickest, the tallest, the longest, the anythingest. Yeah. They just are really smart basketball players and really high-character guys, great leaders, um, and who care and, and, and play the right way and, and – bring their teammates along with them and like that like that's right there alone is just a, a really fun uh i think aspect of this series that's coming i i would completely concur with you on that so who do you think deserves the most credit in the Knicks front office because you and i know we we know what it's like when you win in new york in 94 we got to the to the finals on that Nick team that you were just talking about, who who would you put on the forefront of the turnaround in New York? Because it's a huge turnaround, especially if you ask guys like Stephen A. Smith, who's always yelling about his Knicks, his Knicks. Who who would you give the credit to? I I mean, I, it's it's in this league, fairly or unfairly, you know, we always give credit, you know, almost all the credit and all the all the blame to whoever's at the top of of the <laughs> right. uh, the flow chart there, either as team president or GM. So, yeah. you know, Leon Rose gets gets the credit. Um, he came in as a first time, you know, he's, he's he's team president, so first time team president. Who's he ran the basketball division at CAA. He was an agent for his entire career and a lawyer, uh -huh. not a basketball guy by trade. Um, 
and had never worked in a front office. I certainly was skeptical when they hired him a few years ago. Uh -huh. And I don't think, like, there's a couple, there were plenty of moments along the last couple of years where I thought, yeah, they're doing okay, but there's nothing really to say, like, Leon Rose has really put his stamp on this team. Um, but I, I should, so, so to get back to the, the quick premise here, who, who deserves credit? Obviously, Leon, he's he's the head of, of that yeah. front office, but... Uh, World Wide West, William Wesley, who obviously he brought along with him from CAA, uh, Walt Perrin, who was a you know a, a veteran uh, uh, front office uh, and talent evaluator, uh, who they hired from Utah, Frank yeah. Zanin, who's been working in NBA front offices for a long time. They've got a really good crew. So even if at the very top, if Leon is the guy who, well, he's an agent, not a GM. He's he's not a basketball guy. They've got basketball guys in that front office. And here's where I think their success is, Harp. Um, I think they were hired and Leon was hired because it was like, oh, CAA, he can get he can get star players who are CAA guys. Uh -huh. That's the way that the Knicks always hire. That's the way James, Dol James Dolan has always hired. He always tries to get somebody who he thinks is going to get him stars based on relationships or, or right. reputation. It never works that way. And they haven't, right? They missed out on Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving. Uh -huh. um, maybe they were fortunate to, given the way it went for the Nets. But what they've done right, so they've... They haven't succeeded at the the top level of go get established all stars or all NBA guys. What they have done is, um, they draft really well low, right? Emmanuel quickly was a low first round pick, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Quentin Grimes and, and Deuce McBride. They've gotten they found value deeper in the draft, which is really hard to do. Um, you know, you could question whether or not Obi Toppin was the right pick with Tyrese Halliburton still on the board, but Toppin came through in a pretty major way in this first round series that we just saw. Yeah. Um, but the higher picks they haven't hit on. They've they've been consistently hitting on the lower picks, and then they've been opportunistic. They got Jalen Brunson, and people can yeah. complain about tampering if they want to. The whole league tampers. Um, you right. can say that it's because his father <laughs> is on the bench, or because Leon Rose is his godfather. And, like yes. whatever, it doesn't matter. Family ties, whatever ties. <laughs> They were the ones who decided to invest a hundred million in Jalen Brunson, and it's to their credit. And you know, so I think the it's and then then they are, there's the guys they inherited too. Okay, so Julius Randle was the previous administration, but they they've kept him. Um, Mitchell Robinson was drafted by the previous administration, but they extended him. Um, so they've just made good, solid moves around the edges. There's not one single move that you would say, oh, that's the home run move. Yeah, but the things that they have done have collectively coalesced in a really solid team. I don't know that the ceiling is that high for this team, Harp. You may disagree. I'm not sure yeah. that a team without a single MVP caliber player in a league that's that's always like every you know it's always a LeBron or a Steph or a Kawhi or a Kevin Durant right. who wins the championship. So I I don't I don't see that this team going to the finals yet. But my gosh, I've I've underestimated them, you know, several times already this year. So who knows? I, 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 I could, I could be uh, selling them short again. You know, I for me, I, I think everything is about timing. We talked about the parity, Howard, if you would, in the NBA this year. I didn't ever see uh, at any point during the se the regular season that there was one clear cut favorite to win it all. Well, I take that back. I thought Milwaukee healthy was the best team bar none. <laughs> yeah. Boston, a close second as far as the Eastern Conference is concerned. And and, and, and talking about Boston, um, do they come out of the East now then since you say the Knicks hit or miss, Miami hit or miss, Philly, you know, Doc, we know Doc very well. Do you think that uh, the Celtics, the team to beat so far moving towards the uh, second round? Uh, to me, the Celtics are the team to beat. And I thought even the way the season ended, I felt like though Boston had the second best record in the East, I thought the Celtics, to me, were the team that that had the best case to it to win it all when the, se the when the regular season ended. Um, you know, I, they, listen, it's been an alarming first round for the Celtics. They are yeah. uh, they're they're doing that thing that we see teams do sometimes, great teams do, where you know you you've got the better talent, the better depth, the better everything. And you're up in a series and you start letting a team creep back in because you just don't know how to throw the knockout punch. You get a little complacent. You get you lose focus a little bit. The Celtics, you know, they, they blow leads. They don't finish games. Yeah. Um, I still think they're going to put away the Hawks. I, I you know, that, that should happen a few hours after we record this. <laughs> yes. Um, and 
And then they're going into a second round series against the Sixer team that, uh, you know, the Sixers are, are, are kind of funky, kind of hard to figure out. And Joel Embiid's got a knee issue now that yes. uh, leaves him, as far as I, last I heard, leaves him questionable for to start that series. If, if Embiid is hurt or limited, I, I think, you know, I don't think the Sixers are winning that series. So I, I think the Celtics are in the conference finals against either the Knicks or Heat. And I, I think they've got superior talents no matter which opponent it is. So to me, I, I, I said this the other day, I, the, the Heat knocking the Bucks out in the first round may have paved the way for the Celtics to right. go to the finals because Agreed. I don't think the, the Bucks were the team that had the best chance to beat the Celtics. I don't think the Knicks or the Heat have, have that ability. I, I'm going to shift to the West and, and briefly talk about what's going on there. Obviously, Denver... Uh, won the most games uh, during the regular season. I want to talk about the Lakers and the Memphis series, more LeBron James and and his legacy. He wins a championship this year. Means what? Does it mean he's the GOAT? There's always the conversation, if you would, how it, about who's the best player to ever play the game. I say it's Wilt Chamberlain, but in any event – <laughs> how, how do you see things playing out with LeBron uh, trying to put away the um, the Memphis Grizzlies? I like that you pick Wilt because it's always you know we're such prisoners to the moment uh, in the moment. Oh, yeah. and, people and don't know. It's always it. Jordan versus LeBron. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's always Jordan LeBron, and then at some point, somebody who's a little older than me will say. Uh, you guys have this wrong. It's actually Kareem. And so sometimes we get, yeah. oh, okay, we get Kareem in the argument. But it very rarely goes back far enough for people to bring in Wilt or Bill Russell. Um, I, I'm an agnostic on the GOAT thing. Like, I just, to me, the game has evolved so much that trying to compare players across the eras, God, it's just that. an impossible task. I don't... Mm -hmm. If I don't know if there's an objective answer to the goat question, and I and I'm not sure I care. I don't mind other people debating it till right. the end of time, and they will. Um, I, I don't have a dog in that fight. And if LeBron wins another championship, it would be incredible to do that in year 20 at age 38. Um, I I think the odds are stacked against him, but of man, course, um, it'd be incredible. And and I yeah. think I think I think the Lakers could make a run. Like it, it, the West is 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 kind of wonky right now. Um, they've got to yeah. put away the Grizzlies first and, you know, uh, LeBron did not have a great game last night in game five. And he was the first to say, I played like crap, basically. Um, they, you know, look, LeBron and Anthony Davis are carrying a pretty big load. And for LeBron at this stage of his career to be carrying that much, it's, it's tough. Even in a playoff series where the games are spread out a little bit more, you're, they're bouncing between LA and and Memphis, Tennessee, that's, those are some long flights. And the Grizzlies are younger, uh, yeah. with fresh legs. Um, I know, you know, obviously John Morant's banged up with the wrist thing, but he's been fantastic regardless. I, like, the, the Lakers are playing with fire if they lose Game 6 at home, because winning a yeah. Game 7 with that turnaround going all the way back to uh, to Memphis again um, would, would spell trouble for them. I picked the Lakers in six in this series before it started. I, I it looks like that's the way this is going to play out. I, I think they're going to close it out at home in LA. Uh, it, but they're going to need something like, like they had in, I think it was, was game one when Rui Hachimura had the breakout game. Like yes, one of yes, those guys, yes. a Hachimura or a D'Angelo Russell, Austin yes. Reeves, one of those guys needs, needs a breakout game because, it's too much to ask LeBron to be putting up a triple double every night or to go yeah. score 35, 40. He can, and he might, but they, like the, the guy's got a lot of miles on him and yeah, it's been a tough season for him injury wise too. You know, if healthy, I thought the Clippers would really give the Suns fits. I really did. If they had Paul George, <clears throat> excuse me, and Kawhi Leonard, which brings me to this, Howard. Obviously, injuries are a part of sports, any sport, baseball, basketball, football, you name it. People get hurt. It's just that simple. And Kawhi Leonard has fallen so many times. I mean, he, he has had a hard time staying healthy to help his team advance year after year after year. In fact, Stephen A. Smith quoted was quoted as saying, and I quote, that they should pay Kawhi Leonard – to go away. What, what, what's your take on that? 
And if you would, Howard, talk about load management, because that's something that I am just baffled about, to be completely honest with you. Yeah. So there's a, there's a lot of stuff there, Harp. Um, let me start with, uh, obviously, Kawhi Leonard's not going to be told to go away. Uh, oh, no, no. I, I agree. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, Cl- the, Clippers, <laughs> the Clippers do have... Um, a lot to think about right now. Uh, yeah. Kawhi Leonard and Paul George are going into the last year of their contracts. They're eligible for massive extensions. They both have really tough injury histories, including this season, obviously. They, the Clippers, you know, broadly speaking, again, it's been a failure since they got Paul George and Kawhi Leonard four years ago. They have not gotten the payoff that you wanted, which is to at least make the finals a couple of times and, and win a championship. And they've they've fallen far short mostly because one or both of them is always hurt. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's tough. And they're going into a new building. They finally are going to have their own arena in a year. And you want, you know, the general philosophy is you want star power when you're going into a new building so that you can sell tickets. Of course. And it's it's a lot for them to consider. But I don't think this is a time to go breaking them up. Those guys are hard to come by. Mm-hmm. And granted, it's frustrating as hell, I'm sure, for that fr- um, that franchise and their fan base. But at at full strength, you, there's not too many duos in the NBA who are better than Paul George and Kawhi Leonard together. Um, I, I don't I don't know what the answer there is, other than you know you you keep going and you hope for the best. You hope for better injury luck this time. Yeah. In terms of the the load management part, I mean. Kawhi didn't miss time. Like most of the time Kawhi missed this season, I don't think was about load management. It was, he was injured again. Um, okay. You, He has become the poster boy for load management because of his time in Toronto, specifically the year that he spent there where like they kind of created, I think that, that phrase for him, the way that they were trying to nurse him through the season after he'd had the strange leg injury that, that yes. um, marred his, his final year with San Antonio and that caused the rift between him and San Antonio. Yes. And they nursed him through the season in Toronto. He was fresh for the playoffs. He led them to a championship. And from there, it's like, th- that's where this all kind of like gets set in stone, I think, in the way that we all perceive load management and maybe other teams do too, which is, oh, okay, if you can take your veteran who, whether they have an injury history, whether they are recovering from a surgery that requires them to, you know, um, uh, you know, take more time off in the regular season, whatever it may be, Kawhi Leonard is now the the example of that. They, mm-hmm. they nursed him through the regular season. He played 60 plus games. They won a championship. That's the way to do it. And it's fed into this modern approach to the NBA season in which everybody kind of devalues it, right? We're talking yeah. about shortening the season. It'll never happen because of the money. But we talk about shortening the season because it feels like the regular season just doesn't matter as much anymore. And more and more teams are for in various different ways. It's not all load management, but in various different ways are trying to manage the toll that players take, um, their return from injury, trying to alleviate back-to-backs, those kinds of things. And it's all understandable. Players are making, you know, tens of millions of dollars. And and in fact, over the course of of a single contract, sometimes hundreds of millions of dollars now, it's a massive investment. So it's not just for the player, it's for you as the franchise. This is, you know, you want to protect your investment. You want to get the most bang for the buck out of your investment. And you know, it's it's to everyone's benefit to uh, ensure their longevity and to keep them fresh for the postseason. If you're expecting to make a deep run, I don't know what the answer to that is, Harp. Like, I like I, I would question, not question. I it would be helpful if we, the public, knew more about the science behind this, right? If the medical yes. staffs who are dictating a player's regimen are going to say it's because we are trying to prevent injury or we're trying to nurse them back from this one injury and trying to make sure that it doesn't, they're not favoring the other leg or this or that. It would be helpful if we, the public had more information and data from the experts so that we could understand why this is the right way. Cause in the meantime, all we see is, well, this, these guys aren't playing. They're not playing as much as as their predecessors did in, in, in other eras. They're not playing, and I bought this ticket for hundreds of dollars, and now they're not there. It, it's the right, frustration from the fans is is palpable, and it's justifiable. And while I, I, I'm not one to sit here and like condemn load management, 
All I'm saying is if the league is going to make this the new normal, they owe it to their fan base, to the public, to do a better job of explaining why this makes sense, why this is justified. Uh-huh. So people aren't left in the dark. You know, it's not like tickets are $10 like they used to be when I had hair. So that uh, <laughs> not that makes a lot of sense where, where, where you're going. How, g- g- give the viewers an idea of what the, uh, what the city is like when the Knicks are playing in the playoffs, when they're on top of their game. You know, we talked a little bit off the air about that, how it, it just seems a little different when New York is involved this time of the year. Well, it's, it's, it's interesting. Like, I got here in 2004, and the Knicks were pretty bad and then got progressively worse, and then they'd occasionally have a few signs of life and then, and then get bad again. Uh, so I've, I had only covered, a, like, a couple of playoff games here, really, because they'd only... This, this playoff series victory over Cleveland was only the t- second time they've won a playoff series in, I think, 22 years. Mm-hmm. And the last one was in 2013. That was the year they won 54 games. They get to the second round uh, and lose to the Pacers. I had not been into a playoff game at the Garden in 10 years. Now, they were in the playoffs a couple of years ago against Atlanta, but we were still coming out of COVID. There yes. were still restrictions. I didn't go to those games. The building still wasn't full yet. So I went to game three of Cavs-Knicks at the Garden. And holy crap, Harp. Like, you know from your <laughs> own experience and your playing career – that yep. place was bonkers and yes. <laughs> no piped in noise, no amplified BS. Like this was just natural fan excitement and an intensity. And this is before pregame intros had even started. My eardrums were vibrating <laughs> just from oh, I <laughs> the, the noise of the building. And then as soon as the game did start, the Cavs first possession First possession, there's an entire arena chanting, 19, 20,000 people chanting defense with no prompt from the PA system (laughs) or from anybody else. They just started doing it, and it was loud as hell. And by the way, the Cavs were rattled because of it. Darius Garland, Evan Mobley, these guys are in their first ever playoff series. They're at the Garden. makes a difference. They didn't know what hit them. Yeah. They didn't know what hit them. And all right, look, I'll, I'll, I'll say real quick. So like... Covering those Lakers championship teams in the Shaq Kobe years, Staples Center, while kind of cavernous, could certainly get loud and and had a great home court vibe when they were at their best. Um, Portland at the Rose Garden back in the day was intense. Uh, Key Arena in Seattle was phenomenal. Delta Center in Utah was really loud. Like my early years covering the Lakers, those are the places I remembered being the loudest, the most intense. Um, Boston and, and all the times like I've covered a few finals there now, they're always really great. But I had not really been able to see the garden at full just activation, I guess. Yeah. Until uh this past week. And man, um it's it's wild. And when it's the heat coming to town now, holy man. I, like I, I don't know what's gonna happen. Like the roof I, may I, just I'm, blow off. I'm the gonna place. be in New York doing that series. I can't give you a date. Howard, but I wouldn't miss at least one game in that atmosphere for nothing in the world. I have to get to New York. I've already got some 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 calls in to try to get myself uh, some tickets, and I'm going to come and 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 be a part of all of that that excitement. It's it, it sounded electric in the building in it Game was. Three. Oh, you know what I want to do? I want to ask you where do you think the state of the NBA is right now? Obviously. <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of young players. You know, you got Luca, you got Morant, you got Jason uh, Tatum, you, you, just a lot of young talent. Do you think that the league is in a good place right now? I think the league's in a good place. I think the depth of talent is really incredible in part because we have guys who are the older generation of stars who because of <laughs> maybe whether it's load management or just modern player care, um, better conditioning, year-round attention to their bodies, smarter about nutrition, um, better training, uh, having personal trainers, whatever it is. Le- you know, LeBron is still a star at a very late stage of his career. Uh-huh. You know, Chris Paul is, is, you know, we've seen some slippage, but he's still really effective. Steph Curry, Kevin Durant, like guys are getting into their, at a time when um, in the past you go into your mid-30s, that's when guys start to fall off a cliff. So we, 
that's not happening anymore. So now the stars are extending their careers. And meanwhile, that means a longer overlap with the younger generation, right? Um, and so John ja Morant and Jason Tatum, and these guys are coming up, Anthony Edwards, while the, you know, a generation or two that, pre, that, that were ahead of them are still operating at a high level. So the depth of talent, high level talent is really great right now. Um, what would concern me, I, I suppose, if I were the league office is, you know, there's great talent, Harp, but is anybody yeah. as compelling as LeBron James? Is anybody as compelling as Steph Curry? If those two retired tomorrow, yes. who's who's the must see? And I and I think like John yeah. Morant for just basketball reasons and 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 um, excitement, the way he plays the game, he's an exciting player. Okay, he's he's must see, and and you know maybe whether Giannis or Luca, like there's there's great talent and who I want to watch play basketball. Yeah, but as a as 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 a personality, there's yes. nobody like like LeBron is so polarizing, and Steph is just so unique and and joyful in the way yeah. he plays the game. The charisma, it, it's, it's this undefinable thing, right? Like Michael wasn't like Michael, whether he's the goat or not, um, whether he won <laughs> six championships or not. Michael had a magnetism about him that was bigger than just whether or not he could. Uh, win six titles or be all NBA every year yes. or hang 50 on you or whatever. There's a, there was a, an other element about him and it's why he was the, the, the consummate pitch man too, in, in terms of, uh, his commercial endorsements. Um, when you look at some of the guys now, like Giannis is in a bunch, bunch of commercials and Giannis and Embiid are together in, in, in those, uh, the, the cell phone commercials, but like Luca doesn't do anything. Luca's like not a presence beyond what? Dallas uh, on um, that note, and and, how, and same with Jokic, and same with Jokic. Like these guys are not a, the, the same kind of presence commercially, which I think means it's harder for the NBA to to sell them as the new face of the league once LeBron and Steph are gone. How Fair? how how what if you if you could get in Luca's ear? We we talked about Doncic. We're talking about personalities bigger than life personalities, and some of the guys that we're talking about. What does Luca need to do, in your opinion? Because the guy average. 33 points, eight rebounds, eight assists this past season. But he still doesn't seem to, to uh, grasp what it takes to lead a team. Where, what direction would you point him in if you had the opportunity to? Wow. That's a tough one. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm not, not a player, not a coach, and not, a, yeah, not we're, an agent. We're having so a conversation. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I feel unqualified on some level. So that that caveat out of the way. Um I I so there's different kinds of leadership in this league. I yeah. think you would you would agree with this. Um right? Like there's the guys who lead by example. Yes. There's the guys who lead uh by their 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 presence, their voice. Um and and you could do that in different ways too, right? Like Steph doesn't lead the same way that Kobe Bryant led or that Michael Jordan right. led, right? Nobody like does. Tim Duncan led differently, right? Um, Luca is just such an incredible player and incredible talent. I think he's going to uplift guys around him just by the, the, um, the gravity of his game and the ability to just do so much with the ball in his hands. What would concern me about Luca overall is you know, people have made the comparison a lot to James Harden. I always found James Harden in his Houston days to be frustrating in the sense that he was so ball dominant. Yeah, he could win yeah. you a lot of games. Yeah, he could score a lot, assist a lot, everything else. But I had to feel like watching him, that must not be a lot of fun to be his teammate. The winning is fun, but standing around watching him you know, uh, dribble the air out of the ball would not be. Luka doesn't right. maybe do it quite to the level of James Harden, but his usage rate is, is pretty far up there. Yes. And I think that was the point of the exercise in going and getting Kyrie Irving was to have somebody else who could share the burden, share the load, and, you know, hopefully not burn out Luka, but also make sure that the ball is going somewhere else occasionally so that defenses can't just key in on one guy. But mm -hmm. now you've got two guys who might dominate the ball, and I'm, I'm not sure if I want to be one of the other three guys. And I'm not saying it makes right. them selfish. <laughs> I'm saying that, like, if, 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 if that is the way that you know how to win— and that's what comes naturally to you. And your coach has empowered you to do it this way, whether uh -huh. you're Russell Westbrook or James Harden or Giannis or Luca. 
then I, I get it. So I'm not, I don't, I'm not making the selfish argument at all. What I am saying is I don't know, it, like in, in my view, and I am the outsider in this, but having covered those Phil Jackson Laker teams, having covered Mike D'Antoni for a while, Mike and Phil had two very, very different philosophies about how to coach in the NBA and what kind of offense to run. But the through line, the thing that I think I learned from both of them and that I really respected and that I, I agree with, it's become part of my own basketball values is I think the ball's got to move. I, I think that yes. guys need to feel involved. I think that if, you, if you're at some point in the fourth quarter of a tight game and you're getting double teamed and you finally have to kick it out to, you know, the wing and you haven't passed to that guy in like three hours, <laughs> yeah. he might not be in rhythm and he might not be at his sharpest. Um, I just think that aesthetically, it's more fun to watch basketball of a, for a team that moves the ball the way, say, the Warriors do or the Spurs when they've been at their best. Um, yes. Mike D'Antoni's old son's teams. And I also think that that's what engenders um, a better feeling of camaraderie with your team, right? So, um, you know... I. Far be it for me to tell Luca how to play or Jason Kidd how to coach. <laughs> no, we're not. But I got to think that, or 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 Nico Harrison how to to, to sign players because like I think they need to overhaul the roster, frankly. But right, but we at have an some opinion, point, though. yeah, we the Mavericks opinion, need a team though. where Luca has teammates he trusts and will pass right. to, and and an offense that's a little bit more dynamic, right? Jason Kidd always moved the ball. I can't imagine Jason yes. Kidd really wants Luca to just dribble the air out of it. So, um. I, to me, you need a team with a little bit more dynamism and more playmaking, more everything. I mean, they, they've got a thousand needs, I think, right now. You, yeah. you could speak to that better than I could. You've seen them more than I have. Yeah. I've taken up a lot of your time, and I appreciate your time. But really quick, and I'll get you out of here. Um, who comes yeah. out of the East? I think you said Boston earlier. Who comes out of the West? Yeah. As, as far as you're concerned, who will be in the NBA Finals this year? Yeah. I mean, I'll be surprised if it's not Boston out of the East, but man, in a year like this, nothing should surprise me anymore, I suppose. Um, uh, and, and the Heat and the Knicks and, and even the Sixers, I, I think, would be capable. But I think it's the Celtics. In the West, it's this weird kind of... I, I, I start thinking about it as not who's the most talented team, but who do I trust the most? Like, the yeah. Nuggets are talented and had the best record in the West. I'm not sure I trust them because of you know, their, their inability or, or inconsistency playing defense at a high level. Yes. Um, Jamal Murray's emergence again has, has made them, I think more viable because, you know, Jokic needs a second star to, to take some of the playmaking and scoring duties. Um, the Suns have the best talent on paper, but they just beat a Clipper team that was totally beat up in the first round. Yeah. And we barely saw Durant with that team in the regular season. So I'm not, I'm still not sure what to make of the Suns yet. And their bench is terrible. Um, the Warriors have been wonky all season, but looks like they're going to win their first round series. And I still like, they're the defending champs and I still stubbornly believe in the Warriors. So, Same. um, and then there's the Lakers. I, 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 I'm not sure if the Lakers have enough to get through, but like all any of these teams harp could come out and I wouldn't necessarily be entirely shocked Surprise, if I have right. to pick one I'm going with the Warriors right now going with the Warriors I'm going with the Warriors I I I I trust their championship uh medal basically the muscle memory the the time they've had together knowing each other as well as they do and the thing is like Steph has had no real erosion since a year ago when they won the title Clay is actually better right now than he was a year ago uh, Draymond is still playing at an incredibly high level. Yes. Poole's got that much more experience under his belt. Wiggins has that much more experience under his belt. Peyton, Looney, like that group just won a title last June. Far be it for me to think that they can't do it again. And yeah, I know they've had a weird season, but I, I, I still think they got a shot. You know what? I, I'm, I'm right there with you. I, I'm going to go repeat from last year, the Warriors in Boston, but I only, uh, the thing for me is, Unless something strange happens, I think Boston is a lot more deeper as a team than the Warriors. Yes. And, and the Celtics find a way to uh, to be champions once again. How you're the best, man. I really appreciate your time. Uh, this has been fun. Please come back again and hang out with me on Harp's Court. So thank you. Harp, it was my pleasure, man. It was great talking to you as always. Happy to come back anytime. Absolutely. All righty. Thank you. All of us at the Dub Network would like to thank the crew at Herman Marshall Whiskey for sponsoring another episode of Harp's Court. 
Herman Marshall Small Batch Whiskey is handcrafted and award-winning. And whether it be their Texas bourbon, Texas rye, Texas single malt, or their blended bourbon whiskey, all are built from the grain up, just like good whiskey should be. And make sure you check out their amazing tasting room in Wiley, Texas, if you get a chance. I promise you, you won't be disappointed. It's a great place to pop on in, enjoy one of their specialty drinks or two, or for hosting special occasions like birthday parties, mixers, weddings, or receptions. Thank you so much, Herman Marshall.